Now, in case some of you had heard a rumor that the lecture was canceled, that's not true. There will be a lecture. It will be split. I will take the first few minutes on a little of the background of why rootstocks have come into being or why we use them. And then the man who has done a lot of work with rootstocks and their detailed characteristics, where they should be used and so forth, will take over from that point. Rootstocks are a very expensive way to grow vines. Much more expensive than if you can grow the vines on their own roots. Aside from the economics, there are other certain disadvantages with growing rootstocks that I won't go into at this time. So obviously there must be some compelling reason why we use them. The history of why this has come about is perhaps one of the most dramatic in the annals of plant diseases. A little over a hundred years ago, the Europeans didn't know how well off they were with their vinifera on their own roots. They had to com compete or rather put up with powdery mildew and sulfur dust and so forth. However, some geneticists got curious about some of these American species in America and took them over to France and into Germany and proceeded to use them for various breeding purposes out of curiosity more than anything else. What they did not know was that they took into Europe two of the most devastating pests and or diseases that the vinifera grapevine had ever experienced. On the roots of these American species was a louse insect called phylloxera. The vinifera had never been exposed to this. And under European weather conditions, not only was the vine vulnerable to the attack of phylloxera, but it could form the aerial form and spread with devastating swiftness. And within a few years, the vineyards of most of the European countries, particularly Western Europe, were devastated by phylloxera. Then they had to go to these same species that they were cursing and find out if they could use them to grow the vinifera vines on. Because these vinifera, or the American species, were tolerant or immune, depending on the species, to the phylloxera. Then as a corollary to this, and rather interestingly at the same time, they took into Europe on these American vines a fungus disease that the vinifera had never been exposed to before, downy mildew, paranospora. And here again, this became devastating, but they did find an effective chemical control which to this day is used and known as Bordeaux mixture. It's a mixture of copper and lime. Now this is the downy mildew, and in Europe when they speak of mildew, it's downy mildew, which is a tremendously expensive disease to combat. We are fortunate here that we don't, aren't bothered with the downy mildew in California because of our climate, climatic conditions. Now getting back to rootstocks. As a result, it's almost standard practice in Europe to use them, and then in the latter part of the last century, we don't know whether the phylloxera got into our vineyards in California by way of Europe or from the East Coast. But one way or another, we got the phylloxera, and we are, of course, using rootstocks. Now, a man who's done a lot of work with rootstocks, their characteristics, why we use them, where, when, and how, uh, is going to speak to you about them at this hour. And I'd like to now introduce Dr. Alley, who I think is familiar to everyone already. Kurt? Thanks, Hank. French, French style. Okay, uh, now I'm going to follow this uh, outline that Dr. Olmo, I believe, handed out to some of you students. Or maybe you all have them where, where he, he's given you an outline of the different species. Well, you'll probably get these this afternoon. But. Uh, you only covered part of this, and as rootstocks, a general outline, we can have two general types. We can have own rooted, and we can have grafted or budded. Now, in other words, you wonder what I mean by own rooted. 
Well, when you plant a vine on its own roots, that's own rooted. In other words, it's a, it's a, it's a form of a rootstock. But say you've got Thompson seedless out here, and you find out, well, gee, Thompson seedless, I'll only get $100 a ton if I sell it to the winery. But if I put something like uh, Barbera, French Columbard, Zinfandel, a good variety on top of it, then I'll get a little more money. Fine. So what do you do? So you graft it over. So in other words, now your Thompson seedless has become a rootstock. It's a domestic rootstock, and as long as you don't have phylloxera or nematodes or those things, there's no problem. But when we speak of rootstock, we're generally speaking of something where you've got a, a soil pest. You've either got phylloxera or nematodes. But actually, even a vinifera vine can serve as a rootstock. Now, I think most of you have seen Pinot Noir out in the vineyard. You know it's a weak sister. And you're limited by the size of the vine as to, let's say, what it'll produce. Well, how about putting a strong fruiting variety? Why not French Columbard? Why not put French Columbard on it or underneath it? See, we're starting to think along these ideas where you can grow things in the valley in a cool place on its own roots, but you want to grow a premium variety to say a wheat grower. Well, here's an idea. If you don't want to use a rootstock, you can plant the fruiting variety itself, get a nice vigorous one, and graft or bud your premium on it. That's one idea. Otherwise, you can go to a rootstock in case that we should in the future infect the particular area with phylloxera or nematodes, then having it on a resistant rootstock, knowing what type of soil you have, you'd be safe from future uh, infestations with that soil-borne pest. But there is such a thing as having uh, a variety on a, its own roots or on a, a domestic uh, uh, variety itself. But generally when we're speaking of a rootstock, we're speaking of one of these types. It's either the straight species itself, like Vitus repestris, Vitus champini, or it's one of these hybrids between either a species and a vinifera, or a species, a labrusca, or a species and a species. And we have various combinations now. Now, first of all, let, let's say we're, we're going to talk about a, uh, a regular rootstock. And we have one that's derived from a species itself. And a good example of this would be, well, the, the common one you know is Vitus rupestris. And this rupestris, of course, everybody knows it as St. George, the French call it Rupestris du Lot. And that would be a straight species. It's not a hybrid. In other words, it's a selection of Vitus rupestris. Now, there's also another one, Vitus champini. Now, I'm not saying that this is a seedling selection because Vitus rupestris doesn't bear seeds. So I'm just saying it's probably a selection someplace of a vine itself making cuttings from it. It looks good. In the case of Vita Champini, Vita Champini is a female vine. It does produce fruit. And some of the early breeders have taken a bunch of these seeds and have planted them out and grown them. And here's a good looking seedling here. They've tested it, and this particular one looks good. So then that one is called Dog Ridge. And there was another one that came out very similar to that. And it was also called Salt Creek. They look a little different. They have a similar outline and shape, but when you start studying the leaves, you can see a little difference in there. And we recommend them for different areas. But these are cases of two different seedling selections within the species itself. Now, what if we, say, cross the species? What if we cross, I'm going to stick to right what we have here, riparia. And we cross that with Rupestris. These are small r's. And out of that cross, we get a, 
a good seedling that pans out to be something, and one that came out in the past that the French use is known as Kuderk 3309. And there was another seedling that came out in, in, in similar work like that, and it was called 3306. In other words, it, was, it, had, a, it had a given name to it, and this is what it was called. Or, Berlandieri has been one of their, their famous species that they use that has high resistance to lime soils. And they made crosses between these two species, a Riparia and a Berlandieri. And their particular breeder was named Teleki. And when he finally got through with selecting something out, he, the one that looked good to him was the one that he had labeled as 5A. So we call it Teleki 5A. And then Teleki had a bunch of seedlings, and another breeder in Germany got a hold of those seedlings, and his name was Kober. And he selected within Teleki's seedlings, and he came out with one that he labeled as 5BB. So that's Kober 5BB. It's somewhat similar to the 5A, but they're awfully high in resistance to these high lime soils that they experience over in Europe. All right, and then we can cross another hybrid where we have a species with a vinifera. So for the vinifera, let's take Chasla Doré. I don't know if you've studied that. No, you haven't got that one. No, I, I know you. I gave it to you fellows out there in the class. Chasla Doré is one of the leading white Wine, wine varieties in Europe, they not only use it for making a wine, they also eat it. It's excellent. And they crossed the Chasla Doré with Berlandieri. And they ended up with a, a particularly good looking rootstock that came out of there, and it's called 41B. And they even use that in Europe today very satisfactory one. And then some of the breeders, not to be outdone, have gone even one step further. They've taken one of these hybrids and crossed it back to another species. And a good example of that is a Vinifera crossed with a Rupestris. And this, in turn, crossed with a Riparia. And uh, that's come out with another number, 196-17, and it's called Castell. Now, we don't use any of these, but I'm just, these are just examples that you can find. And if you, if you want to really get involved and study rootstocks, come on up to the office. I'll let you read this. It's in French. But they have beautiful pictures of all the rootstocks, and it tells you all about them. It's terrific. There's one table back in here that tells you just what these are good for, the type of soil it, that they prefer. Uh, their phylloxera resistance, their nematode resistance, uh, how good they are for uh, different types of soils. It's all in here. We don't use them, so I'm not going to bother you with, with it, but if you do want further information, you're welcome to study them. Now, let's take a look at what we're using in California, though. Okay, first of all, we have phylloxera. We have phylloxera, and we're using primarily two stocks. We're using St. George, which you know is one of these selections out of Vitus repestris itself. And we recommend that just for certain places. First of all, it's extremely vigorous. It's a bushy type of a plant. It's extremely vigorous. So in other words, you don't want to plant it in a place where it's going to have lush growing conditions. Otherwise, it tends to promote an unfruitful condition to the vine. So th therefore, under those circumstances, we recommend it on a hillside. In other words, a shallow soil. You got to make it suffer in order to slow it down. We recommend it where you're not going to irrigate. So non-irrigated vineyard. So these are the two main recommendations for St. George rootstock. 
It is so vigorous, if you're going to have it grow real vigorous, because it'll, it'll give you a large vine, then you cut down on your amount of fruitfulness. So in other words, make it suffer a little. Uh, the, ver the rootstock itself has a deep tap root. In other words, your AXR number one, which is the other stock, grows out like this, your root system. St. George, it goes just about straight down like that. In other words, it gets its feet down when there's moisture. So that's why it's so vigorous. That's why it can stand dry conditions. It roots very easily. It grafts very easily. When it does root and graft, it produces plenty of callus. There's no problem with it. It's excellent for that. There's only one catch. It's just too vigorous. It's a vigorous stock. And that's its main trouble. It is the highest of our resistance, stocks that are resistant to phylloxera. It has very high resistance. Actually, uh, we're fortunate in California that we have weather conditions that are not conducive to the spread of phylloxera, except through the soil, which is slow. If we had those conditions like we have in Europe, we'd be in trouble. We wouldn't be able to use our AXR number one stock. We'd have to resort to this or develop a new stock for our own California conditions. So this is a stock we use under certain, certain places, hillsides, non-irrigated, if you want to get a decent crop because of this vigorous condition, slow it down. The other one we use primarily is AXR number one, and that is a hybrid between Aramon. Aramon is a great big black grape, very heavy producing. They use it in France for wine production. Don't say anything about quality. Just say, ah, oh, I got lots of fruit, and you got Aramon. But it's Aramon, and it was crossed with Vitus rupestris. And it's the Vitus rupestris ganzin. This is the one that it was crossed with. And it's called AXR number one because it was this cross, it was the, the number one selection. So it's A Aramon rupestris ganzin AXR. Now, this is a weaker stock. This is weaker. It doesn't have nowhere as a phylloxera resistance. Let's say moderate resistance to phylloxera. That's why I say if we ever get an aerial form in California, look out. You might as well wrap these up and, and, and replant because it can't take it. It's not used in France because of this condition. They tried it there and they had a catastrophe. So out it went. In California, we can get by because we don't have these conditions. It's a weaker vine. And yet you compare for the same variety where we've had tests on non-irrigated soils or even non-irrigated. You put AXR here and you put St. George here and you have the, two, the same variety on the top of the two. This St. George is going to be a nice big husky vine. And this will be two-thirds the height, but this will produce a bigger crop than that one. So that's the reason, under certain conditions, we recommend this. Where we have irrigation, and this is what all our new vineyards are going in, in most of our coast counties, they're putting in sprinkler system, or they're finding some sort of, sort of irrigation. So where you have irrigation, it's perfect. Or if you have a deep soil that has a good water holding capacity, then this baby is the one we're using. These roots are shallow. They go out and explore that soil. So as long as they can get water, they're happy. Then you'll get a higher production than St. George, even though the vine is smaller. It sets better, gives you a better set. We're also trying another, another stock, one of the best stocks in Germany. It's SO4, or it's Selection. Oppenheim, number four. Why are we using it? This has got good phylloxera resistance, better than AXR. It's really a stock developed for, for high lime soils. 
but we're trying it out. We're not recommending. We're trying it out to see if it might serve as a replacement for AXR, because this thing won't bench graft worth a pile of beans. It produces very little callus. It roots fairly good, but the callus production where you make your union is very poor. If you don't get much union, well, you don't get a very good take. Question? AXR. AXR, yeah. In other words, the nurseries, there's only two of them that have been, been bench crafting for years up in Napa Valley and over around Healdsburg. Sort of shudder when, when the grower says, I'd like to get some bench crafts on AXR because they get a very poor take. They can get, say, 80, 85% successful take using St. George. When you talk AXR, where they sort of shake their head and they try to steer away from it. I'd rather sell you the, the, the rooted vines and you go out there and plant them out in your vineyard and you butt them. But as far as bench grafting, my, they can't make enough out of them. So they hesitate about using AXR for bench grafting. On the other hand, SO4, it roots well, it produces nice callus, bench grafts well, so it is being tried. So I'll put down here, uh, we recommend this strictly under irrigation. Now we have this planted up at our Oakville test plot, which is dry farmed, and you ought to see it. Talk about having a runt, that's it. It, it even does poorer than AXR as far as growing. So we would not recommend this under, uh, under non-irrigated conditions. So right now, we can't say anything except the fact that it is under test. The Europe Europeans say it is one of the best stocks they have over there. And we are just going on their recommendations, trying it here in California to see what it'll do. It is phylloxera resistant. It is a phylloxera resistant stock. In fact, all of these are phylloxera resistant. They are not nematode resistant. Let's get this straight. This is, we're not talking nematode now. We're talking strictly phylloxera. More so than uh, AXR. This has better resistance to, to phylloxera than AXR. A AXR is only moderate. So as long as we, we don't build up a, a population of phylloxera, we don't have any problems. OK. Now, let's go over. See, we, we, we've known phylloxera for years and years and years because we've dealt with phylloxera. Now, you get down in the valley, you have sandy soils. You don't have phylloxera. So we've got another problem. We've got these nematodes. And most of the nematodes, the only thing we've known for years was the old root knot. And the root knot, if you want to know what it, what it is, it's M-E... L-O-I-D-O-G-Y-N-E. Lodogyne. And we had two of these species. We had Incognita and Javanica. <laughs> and this Incognita goes one further. It's called Acrita. Let's forget that. But anyway, we got root knot nematode and root knot nematode, if you want to know what it is, it's M-E-L-O-I. That's what it is. That's a root knot. And we, all we knew about for years was root knot nematodes, so we had to have something resistant to, resistant to it. So along comes good old, uh, it's a hybrid. It's 1613. It's Kudurk. And this was a hybrid of Vitus salonis. That's a little s. With, I think it's a vinifera. Maybe somebody will correct me. Othello. And this thing here was supposed to have resistance to nematodes. And as far as we know, it, it was resistant to the incognita. We found out later when the nematologist was able to separate into more than one category, he found out that, well, this, ne this rootstock wasn't the best stock there was because it was good against incognita, but it wasn't good against Javanica. So as long as you didn't, didn't have Javanica, you're all right. So we've been for years we've been using 1613, where you have sandy soils. All right, then, then you go down into Coachella Valley, where you have sand pile, or you go up to here or you, further north around Livingston and Modesto, and you have sandy soils similar to Coachella Valley, similar to a sand pile, 
And this thing won't even do anything. It can't even fight its way out of a paper bag. So that didn't work. So they had to find something else. So we had these other rootstocks we were working with. And we had the Divida Champini types. And now we had Salt Creek. And we had Dog Ridge. Two Champini types. Now maybe in the future you're, you're going to come across a reference to a rootstock called Ramsey. Oh. Mr. Loomis, that's working with the USDA down at Fresno, wasn't that this name here never did agree with him. It sort of rubbed him the wrong way. He didn't like it, and so he imported a Ramsey stock, or not. In other words, he imported stocks from down in Texas. And he got our, our salt creeks, and he put the two together because he knew that, that there was a little different, that there was something crazy about this whole thing. And the two were identical. But in the literature, he found out that this particular stock that came from Texas was known as Ramsey. And that was reported long before we had this name Salt Creek. So there has been a publication that come out within the last two years where the real name for what we know as Salt Creek now to be Ramsey. So in case you come across Ramsey in the future, you'll have in your notes, oh yeah, that's our Salt Creek. So that, that's just for your own information. But we use these two stocks, and good old Champini here is resistant to both phylloxera and nematodes. But we only recommend it in sandy soils. Now, what's the, what's the difference between the two? Okay. Salt Creek. and Dog Ridge. Recommended only in, in clean, uh, pure sand. What happens if you put them, say, in a nice sandy loam? Well, both of them are so doggone vigorous, they become rather unfruitful, just like St. George. They have too much zip for nice soils. They grow too fast. They grow too vigorous. They will not set. In other words, they go into a vegetative set and, and they won't set, and of course, with nothing, no breaks on that vine to hold it down by fruit, they just keep growing faster and faster, and in other words, they, they just get away from themselves. So we do not recommend these two for, say, a nice sandy loam or a soil in which you'd plant 1613. But in a sand pile, they're terrific. Now, there's only one difference. Salt Creek, you plant where you have sand and maybe a little bit of loam, in other words, a little richer soil because Salt Creek is not quite as vigorous as Dog Ridge. Otherwise, the two are identical. If you have real pure sand, you can plant Salt Creek. If it can hack it, fine. If it can't hack it, then you put in Dog Ridge. And then that slows it down enough to where it will give you a commercial crop. But these are our two most vigorous stocks. Fortunately, they're resistant to both phylloxera and nematode. All right. So we have in California a lot of soils that aren't sand piles, but they are sandy loam. And we don't have anything. 1613 is not that good, because that's only resistant to our root, one of our root knot nematodes. These are, say, resistant to both root knot nematodes. Fine. Well, uh, Dr. Weinberger at the USDA in Fresno, about four or five years, years ago, he took a seedling of 1613. In other words, I, I told you this thing produces fruit. So he took a seed, seedling of that, grew it into a plant, and then he took a seedling of Dog Ridge. And he crossed the two. And he got out this particular one. It, it had a number at first, but then it proved out pretty good. So now he's called this Harmony. So this is the one that he maintains has resistance to both types of phylloxera, of those root knots. And it can grow in a moderate soil. It's nowhere as vigorous as Dog Ridge or Salt Creek. It's, it's more vigorous than 1613. And 
It has the resistance to both of these root knots. So fine, now we're doing pretty good. Uh, it's only been tested for about the last, I'd say, six or seven years. It roots very easily. It grafts very easily. It had not been tested on all wine varieties, so as far as the performance, we cannot say. Question? Uh, what about other species of nematodes like leech and bagger? That's what we're coming up to next. OK. So uh, we're going along fine here. We think we got all our problems licked. And son of a gun, uh, there's places where you plant Salt Creek or Dog Ridge, nice sandy soil. You think, well, these things will take it. And they still don't do any good. In other words, it doesn't make sense. They won't grow. So finally, Mr. Nematologist comes along and says, well, hmm, you don't have root knot nematode. Now you have another nematode. In other words, they're always coming up with something new. So he says, oh, you haven't got root knot. Now you got lesion nematodes, Pratolinka species. And that's the reason why those rootstocks won't work. They're not resistant to the lesion nematodes. And this is where we stand right now. We don't have a rootstock resistant to lesion nematode. And let's go one step further. Along with the Pratolinchus species of nematode, which is a lesion, the pathologists and, and the nematologists have gotten together and say, hmm. Now here's a nematode This baby here is even worse than, than, than lesion because this is another type of a lesion nematode, but it's the one that carries this soil-borne disease known as fan leaf or cour noy. This one up here doesn't, but this one does. And this is found spread rather 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 widely in, in not only uh, vineyards, but it's found in, in orchards. In fact, it was first found in a fig orchard down south. That's where they isolated it. But this is the one that spreads one of our virus diseases. And to make things even worse, we don't even have any rootstocks resistant to it. Dr. Leiter has been doing some screening of, of different species. And he's found out that there are two species now that show resistant, resistance to Zephanema. And one of them is Vitus rufo tomentosa. And the other one, I think, is Vitus longii. There's also one that has some resistance. It's Vitus solanus. This one shows resistance. What does that mean? It means this. Good old 1613 here, which has Vitus salonis, does show some resistance to Zephanema index. And how do we know? For years, in Livermore Valley, they've had a heck of a time getting our phylloxera stock, which is supposed to be in the soil down there. It's a rocky, loose soil. The vines won't grow. You plant St. George, you plant AXR, and the, the vines poop out. So Dr. Goheen finally says, well, this doesn't make sense. So he said, well, I'm going to find out what stock will work down there. So he planted St. George, he planted AXR, he planted 1613, and he planted either Salt Creek or Dog Ridge in a test plot. And what happened? 1613 did better than the rest. And it didn't make sense until he realized they had a Zephanema index down in the soil. So that rootstock does show a certain amount of resistance to our Zephanema index. Rotundifolia is resistant. Supposedly it's supposed to be resistant to everything. It's supposed to be our, our panacea. And Dr. Olmo has broken the interspecific barrier between rotundifolia and vinifera. He does have some of these hybrids now growing out in the vineyard. I haven't seen them. But they have the resistance, supposedly, to what we need and are also starting to produce a decent type of a fruiting crop from which we can make wine. In other words, this is the beginning of 
developing resistance to, into some of our vinifera varieties or some of our better rootstocks. It's only the beginning right now. I think that will be all for right now. Any questions? Question. If you graft over the top of the vinifera, what, how much problem are going to do that? well, it all depends what's in the soil. In other words, if you graft on top, it's not going to do you a bit of good because it's what's in the soil that counts. This is where you need your resistance. I mean, just as a, just as a general, is that possible to do or not? No. No, in other words, it... I'm not talking about your effect your resistance in the soil. I'm just talking about low vine growth. Do that to it. If it has a rootstock in the soil that's resistant, anything you put on top will grow. I mean, you can theoretically graft several times one over the top of the... Oh, end. yeah. You can graft several times. In other words, you can start down low. You, you can go right on up as high as you want and put something uh, different on top of it each time. Or you can take a rootstock, cut it off right here. You, you, you can put a sign of one variety over here and a sign of one variety over here and, and bring out two varieties. Or if you want to, I've fooled around with, with bark grafting, and I, I've put as high as 20 different signs on one stock there. I got about half of them to grow, so you can, you could, in other words, make as many varieties as you, as, as you want on that. That's a possible. That's no problem. Question. Do you have a figure of how the percentage of grafting takes on a salt tree and a dog root, which is better? No. Uh, as far, now I'll say this much. Salt Creek or Dog Ridge, as far as grafting goes, and if I'm speaking bench grafting, I will not recommend that you bench graft with a cutting because Salt Creek by far is the worst for to root. You'll get about a 50%. If you start with 100 cuttings of Salt Creek, and you get 100 to, of those to root, you're doing good. So if you tried bench grafting, where the common practice is to use a rootstock cutting rather than a rooting, you would end up with a catastrophe. On the other hand, Harmony works very well as far as bench grafting. So in other words, you could get a very high take by using Harmony or 1613 or the other common rootstocks. They will bench graft very, very well. But not Dog Ridge or Salt Creek. Dog Ridge will graft a little better, or it will root a little better than Salt Creek. But I would not bench graft those as cuttings. Are any of these uh, native to California? Any of these uh, uh, stocks? Uh, no, no. They're all southeastern United States. Isn't there a, a vitus? Uh, There's a vitus californica. It's the wild grape of California, and it, its range is from, say, that the Hatchaby Mountains clear up into Oregon, and it grows all along the creek banks, into the trees all over, or you'll find hybrids of Vitus California and some of the vinifers that are escapes. But Vitus California itself is susceptible to both nematodes and phylloxera. It is not resistant, as a lot of people would think it is resistant, but under controlled tests where you put them in pots with either phylloxera or nematode, look out, it goes out. Dog Ridge is a little, is the less vigorous of, of the two. Dog Ridge is the most is the vigorous. Most? Is the most vigorous that we have for a rootstock, yes. Okay. Hank? the word direct producer may come up here? Oh, uh, after the French developed, well, after the French had their rootstocks and they had their fruiting varieties, they didn't like the idea of having to plant a rootstock, either bench graft and then, or graft to it, with your fruiting variety. So they thought of the idea, well, shucks, why can't we develop by crossing a rootstock with our Pinot Noir or our good fruiting varieties and have everything in one? In other words, the fruiting variety has the resistance you want. And of course, at that time, their big problem was mildew resistant. So they did make hybrids. They, they did quite a bit of hybridizing of the resistant rootstocks with the fruiting variety that's, uh, itself and they developed these vines, which they call French hybrids, or direct producers. In other words, the things were resistant to downy mildew, which was their biggest headache, and it was resistant to phylloxera. 
and they have them. And uh, there are a lot of these French hybrids. There's a Cybelle, Saviville Yard, Lando. You'll see all those things mentioned, and they're all French hybrids or direct producers. Most of them are resistant to uh, phylloxera and downy mildew. If you're talking about nematodes, forget it. If you're talking about powdery mildew, forget it. Do any of those make a uh, comparable wine? No. No, in fact, on, on all the tests we have, uh, most of the wines of the French hybrids are of just mediocre quality. And that's the reason we do not recommend them in California, because they don't have nematode resistance. They don't have quality. So we don't even plant them here. Uh, they, they are, there are certain ones that are planted uh, on the East Coast because some of them have good winter cold resistance. And they're planted over there. But in California, no. Okay.